you know that the overarching um, theme is the end times. So I've taught on the book of Revelation probably four times over, these, over the last few years, certainly three times um, we've gone through. This is going to be a little bit wider than just the book of Revelation. We're going to involve some other teachings and some other locations as well. And the way I'm doing this particular one is that I'm say, taking a little subject, a little subject, and then we're going to sew them all together at the end. So uh, a few weeks ago, we started with just a summary of, if you like, the return of Christ, when he comes back to, to judge the earth. And we looked at the fact that uh, um, Jesus' job description, which is mentioned in Isaiah 61, he repeats in Luke chapter 4. He goes into the temple and he reads through his job description and he stops at the year of the Lord's favour. But this is the year of the Lord's favour. When he's on this earth, this is the year of the Lord's favour. Okay, so the year of the Lord's favour. And so, once we reach that stage, that is when the Lord has come, his salvation message, it is, it is the kingdom of God coming to this earth, it's your sins being forgiven, it's a way to glory, it's an access to heaven, that is the year of the Lord's favour. Summarised by the fact that that, in Hebrew terms, is when uh, uh, people are returned to their rightful Owners, in other words, when people who are enslaved to sin are set free and return after 50 years. So that's why he stops at that point, and then we look further. But his job description goes on in Isaiah 61, where he then talks about the next sentence the year of the or, or the day of the vengeance of the Lord. So the year of Jubilee, but the day of vengeance. And there will be a day of vengeance when our Lord returns and wraps everything up. And then we're going, uh, going to see uh, a various judgment that will fall uh, and various aspects that will go on. But it will be a day. It will be a day. It will be a day that ends all days. And so we touched on that very briefly. We will certainly revisit it. Last week we looked at uh, a good news story, which is the rapture of the church. And I will preach and teach the rapture of the church because I believe that, that we, as a body of Christians, will be taken out of the world before the last seven years. And the last seven years are the, uh, you know, that, that, that time of tribulation. Okay, three and a half years where it will be bad, three and a half years will, will be like nothing that's ever been on this earth. But a pattern of the way our Lord operates is that he basically says this, I will take you out. And he took people out in Noah's time. So when, when, the, when the judgment came on the earth, the people were taken out, the righteous ones, Noah's family, in the ark. And so there's one of the patterns, Sodom and Gomorrah. There's another pattern where he takes the righteous out before his judgment falls. And we looked at some others. And we looked at the um, Rahab. So Rahab was righteous. She put a red cord outside. There was a red cord of redemption there. And Jericho fell, but her room didn't. In other words, you're safe if you're in Christ. You're safe if you're in the ark. You're safe if you obey the angels. You're safe if that red cord is in your room. And they're all patterns of Christ. They're all patterns of who he is. And so that is where the rapture teaching comes in. And people say, well, the rapture's not in the Bible. It depends what Bible you've got. Because if it's in the Latin, that's what it is. And basically it means to be called out. To be pulled out. And so, uh, again, we'll revisit this. But we looked at that briefly last week. This is going to be probably one of the heaviest of sessions we're going to do because we're going to talk about another subject which is end times and very significant and that is the subject or the doctrine of hell. Mm. Now churches don't speak about hell, they speak about heaven a lot but I tell you there is a hell yeah. and we need to know about it, we need to understand it, we need to realise that Jesus taught a lot about hell and so we need to be able to, be able to explain it to people because hell can be avoided, mm. hallelujah, and heaven embraced. And so we're going to look at that today. Next week, we're then going to look at um, some of the uh, characters uh, in, in, in the sort of end time side of things. We're going to look at some point at this, this thing called the tribulation. We're going to be looking at heaven as well, which I may bring in actually next week, uh, because heaven needs to be talked about if hell is being talked about. 
all right? But we need to make sure. So let me just open in prayer. This is heavy. I don't want it to be. I don't enjoy preaching about this subject, but we must, and we must embrace it. We must. And, it, and for the reasons I will give at the end. So Father, we just come before you, Lord. And Father, uh, although there are subjects that are very difficult to talk about because of the finality of it, and for the anguish of it, but Lord, we have got to understand the doctrines of hell so that we can preach the gospel in a more fervent and passionate way. We thank you, Lord, that, that hell is, is, is uh, not an option that we need to step into. Hallelujah. For you have made a way. You have made a way. And everybody who ends up in hell, it's because their will has made it happen. My Lord, you don't, your will is that not one would perish. Not one. And you've done all you need to do to populate heaven. So Lord, help us to understand this difficult subject. And to understand it with clarity, with an absence of emotion, so that we can teach others in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 There was a survey done in 2021. So it was a recent survey. I haven't got the full numbers that were surveyed, uh, but I've used it several times on other subjects. And it spoke about various Christian or various um, things of beliefs about the afterlife. And it said this, that 92% of Christians believe in an actual, a physical heaven. Now that surprises me, because that means 8% don't. But 98%, oh sorry, 92% of Christians believe in an actual heaven. But here's the stat that I find I struggle with. 79% of Christians only believe in an actual hell. So more Christians believe in, a, in an actual heaven than they do in an actual hell. Now why do you think that is? What do you think that is? I would have thought 100% Christians would believe in actual heaven, and 100% Christians actually believe hell. But there's some. What do you think that is? It's not exactly a happy subject, though, is it's it? It's not a happy subject, but can does shouldn't stop the way we believe. But you're right, Sue. You're right. Take. God is too good to send you to hell. Hmm. Mm. Yeah. So that would be a major one that that we preach in churches messages about concerning God's love, mm. and rightly so. God's love, God's love, God's love, God's mercy, God's grace, God's forgiveness. How could a God of love send anybody to a place of eternal separation? That's the question. And so many Christians, and they say this survey, so uh, nearly 20% nearly of Christians don't actually believe that there's a, a physical hell. And we're going we to touch on that at some other point. Here's another one. 45% of Christians believe that people can go to heaven without actually believing in God. Mm. Mm. Bizarre, isn't it? But that's what this survey. Now, what are they basically saying? They don't need to see, see the salvation. They don't need to see the salvation. God is good, and eventually everybody ends up with him. Now, I would have laughed at those stats and said that's ridiculous, but I have met Christians who actually believe that. They actually would say, no, I, I, I can't believe. I can't believe that people would suffer. I don't believe that Jesus suffered on the cross. Um, there's a big organization, the Oasis, um, who run that school next door. Um, and uh, the, the, the lead guy of Oasis there um, teaches regularly uh, against the um, atonement. Doesn't believe that Jesus suffered on the cross. Uh, doesn't didn't believe that uh, the Lord was uh, shed blood and things like that on the cross. And and if we teach our children that, then that's child abuse. This is a major church in Waterloo Road in South London. And that guy, I can't think what's his name. What's the name of the guy that runs it? I can't think of his name. Um, Head of Oasis is, I can see his face now. He's called on television many times to give the Christian perspective. But what they don't say is that he's been kicked out of Evangelical Alliance. Yeah. <laughs> and they won't accept. But, but this is it. So what I'm saying is that amongst brothers and sisters in Christ, who you would say are brothers and sisters in Christ, there are conflicting views and beliefs concerning the doctrine of heaven and the doctrine of hell. 
I want to say this, that there's a very clear doctrine of heaven in this church and a very clear doctrine of hell. Mm. You will end up in one or the other. There's no sitting in the middle. There's no half measures. There's no if, buts or maybes. You're in one or you're in the other, eventually. We praise God that, 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 that when the gospel is preached and you believe it with all your heart, you will end up, hallelujah, with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And one of the things I often have to speak to our young people about is, you know, have I committed a sin that's taken me out of heaven and put me into, into hell's books? And I say, if you're asking me the question, you're, you're safe. You're safe. All right? People get into hell because they, they, they don't know the spiritual dynamics that are going on. If you're asking questions about your spirituality, you're safe. You're safe. Your name gets written in the Lamb's book. How do you know your name's written in the Lamb's book? The Bible says... And the Spirit confirms. Mm. And you'll know it. You'll know it. You'll know it in your Noah. All right? This is this area here. This is your Noah. All right? So you haven't got to worry about that. But those places are very, very real. Now, why do you think there's so much difference in those statistics? Why do you think some people who were professed to be Christians, and, and as we said there, uh, T mentioned there, you know, we've got a God of love and things, but why, why, why is that those things still existing in the body of Christ in 21st century? Why do you think there is? There's some, you know, give me some answers. It's easy. It's easy. Yeah, yeah it, it, it is easy. Thank you, Bobby. Yeah, it's an easy thing to say, isn't it? Many, many Christians, I believe, are not challenged mm -hmm. and they just live out this hairy, fairy life, if you like, based on a prayer they said a few years ago, you know, and, and they, they, it doesn't change anything, it doesn't alter anything in their lives. And when they had this survey, they, you know, that's the sort of stuff they come out. So it's easy. I would say this, that many people who profess to be Christians are not actually saved themselves. Mm -hmm. You'd know the passage of Scripture. We've spoken on it many times, you know, that you can drive out demons in the name of Jesus. You can heal the sick in the name of Jesus and it will boil down to one day and Jesus will say, get away from me, you who practice lawlessness. I do not know you. And it will boil down to that question, not what we've done for Jesus, not how we've lived for Jesus, but whether Jesus knows us and whether we know. Because that knowing is all to do with relationship. Yes. And I'm afraid the way the gospel is preached at times in churches up and down this land, there is a lightness in that message. And people think they're saved because they come to Christ in the building, but there's no actual change of things and circumstances. And so that's one of the reasons. Another reason, I think, is that it is wrongly taught. So there's an emphasis on the grace message. There's an emphasis on, on the, uh, you know, the goodness of God. It's, there's a, it's, it, but, it, but, but you don't talk about the severity of God. You see, a God is a God of love will also be a, be a God of judgment. Because it isn't loving to say to, to allow a child to burn its hand. It, you have to at some point smack the hand and say, don't do that. It's not loving to, to just ignore the child and just say, you know, burn your hand then. Burn your hand. And so our God is a God of, of love, but he's a God of judgment. There is a line. If you cross the line, trespassers will be prosecuted. That's in reality. And so we know where the line is, but we cross it. And so we have Christians who feel that they can have relationships with who they want to. We have Christians who feel that they can, they can dabble with various bits and pieces, be it criminality, be it uh, uh, bending tax rules, be it, be it do it, you name it, Christians think they can do it. Do you know what the average uh, marriage uh, expectancy for in, in the US at the moment is eight years. That's the average length of a marriage in America. And there is no difference between those who are in the church and those who are outside the church for marriage length of time, on average. Eight years. Extraordinary. It's extraordinary. I worked with uh, some missionaries, so unless they've come here in the past, and they said the biggest problem they've got with their churches is that, that often people are doing things on a Sunday now more than anything else. So if there's a, a football match, yeah. American football, you won't get them in the church. People are off, they're out the door. 
can't find where anybody is, they've all gone. And sports is the new God. And people bow down and worship. Christians I'm talking about. I'm not talking the world, I'm talking believers. And I want to say this, people are dabbling. Because in that sort of cover, do you know the Lord? Do you know? And so this is serious. And so not saved, wrongly taught. And the other one is a slightly less lesser reason, but it's it's there. And it's a, a false hope. And, that, and what I mean by that is that you hope you will get to heaven. I was banging on the doors in a, in, a, in a housing estate in Belfast many years ago. And I knocked on a door in an estate, in, in a uh, uh, um, housing estate, Protestant housing estate in Rathcool, which is an area of Belfast, preaching the gospel, teaching, and all that stuff. And an elderly gentleman opened the door. And, you know, he wanted to hear the gospel, and, and I gave him the gospel. I was with somebody else at the time. And, and, and then I said to him, do you, I mean, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He was so keen to do it. And he said, no. When I die, I just want to go where my wife has gone. That was the sentence. And I said, well, where's she gone? He said, I don't know, but, but wherever she is, I want to go. <laughs> And I said, well, if you don't know where she's gone, what's the basis of, of your... He said, and what was it? There was a false hope. He felt that when he died, they're going to meet up. There's going to be a family reunion. He doesn't know where it's going to be, but he's going to be with his wife. I want to tell you this, that when we die, uh, if, if we end up in the, in the kingdom of darkness, it is eternal separation. There are people who, who commit suicide and their last thoughts are, this is going to ease the pain of what I'm going through. It's going to be an eternal sleep. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be in a soft bed. I'm going to sleep forever. Mm-hmm. And as they slip into that kingdom of darkness, that Christless eternity, they realise it's irreversible. Mm-hmm. It's irreversible. Because the decisions we make on this earth <laughs> is where... The, you know, where we spend the rest of eternity. You see, you and I are eternal beings. This is why abortion is such a difficult subject for us to face, you know, because it's such an important subject, because life is eternal. It just depends where you spend that rest of eternity. And the Lord has made it this way. He said, you make the decisions on this earth as to where you're going to spend eternity. Which is why our job is such an important job to be ambassadors for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and to point to the door and say, that's the way. Let me show you. Let me introduce you to the way. And again, I'm going to give a quote in a few minutes from Spurgeon. Uh, It's just wonderful, but it really does galvanize us to evangelism. This is a heavy subject. It's a heavy subject. But you've got to get passionate about it. You've got to. May it be that we never get to a place where somebody says, you didn't tell me. You didn't tell me. I'd rather lose friends talking about hell than to to know that they got there without me saying something. I'd rather lose family, and I have lost family, talking about this stuff, than for them to slip into a, a kingdom of darkness, not having heard, not having been challenged on this subject. And so end times and the doctrine of hell is an important, important one. Also, I don't think people like to think of eternal things. We live in a very here and now, it's over and done with, disposable sort of world. I was thinking about the rubbish bags that we've, we, we, we have given out now over, uh, over the years. You know, when we started off, it was almost a carrier bag, wasn't it? But now, you know, we're, 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 we're two or three rubbish bags uh, stuff. And the stuff, I'm doing tip runs now probably three, three times a month, certainly two times a month, just disposing of stuff, you know. It's a disposable world. The boot is full of disposable stuff. Mm. You know, look at the barbecue, disposable plates, disposable cups. We're in a disposable world. It's normal, it's life, that's the way things are. But we, we, all, we all have a mindset at times that eternity is a bit disposable. Mm. It's not an area we want to talk about because everything is instant. Everything is, is this, that and the other. And so 
Uh, people don't like to talk about it. I mean, you raised the question perhaps in your canteen or something, you know, where do you think you will spend eternity? That will get people talking, but it may be very difficult. But I tell you this, if somebody is willing to talk to you about eternity, they are close to the kingdom of God. Yeah. If this subject produces a conversation, go for it with all that you've got, because that person is thinking about eternal things. And it's a green light, you know, and people can get, you know, uh, the, the end times message can be a message that leads people to Christ. Yeah. So if you start hitting, you know, people start talking to you about, well, do you believe in hell? Yeah. Well, yeah, but I also believe in heaven. Yeah. What do you think heaven looks like? Mm. I don't know, clouds with angels. And, well, why is that? What's that based on? I don't know, it's a picture. Of, well, what do you think heaven's based on? Well, the Bible tells me. But it also tells me there's another place, a Christless eternity. What do you think that looks like? I don't know. Well, do you, you know, and, and I tell you, there was a film many years ago called The Exorcist. I hope you've never watched it. Be careful. It carries a demonic, a demonic power within it. It was before my time with our previous church. But they, when that film was being played at the Ashford Cinema, they sent teams of of uh, evangelists out so that when the last showing came out they could at least start to counsel some of the people who were coming out shocked oh. horrified knowing they weren't going to sleep that day or that night and we were there we would use it as a gospel side of things but there's a whole realm of darkness that people dabble in. They will watch horror films. They will watch, they will watch uh, films with extreme violence very, very easily. But when you start talking about this stuff in eternity, it changes people's thinking. They don't want to know. They don't want to know. But when they do, go for it. They don't you've got. Because they're close to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Now then. I say, this is not a subject you're going to hum to. <laughs> All right? This is not a subject I'm going to hear applauses on and uh, fist pumps and hallelujah, praise the Lord. Okay? <laughs> but this is a subject we've got to know. We've got to nail it. We've got to nail it. And Jesus spoke, uh, this is the subject that Jesus spoke about. It's almost like he wouldn't hand it to anybody else. He wouldn't hand it to Paul, although Paul mentioned the, the getting into heaven. He, he didn't hand it to Peter. He spoke himself about hell and so it was the subject if you like that he took greatest responsibility for and in the in the bible there are four main words for hell so it's translated hell but it means four different things and and we can get into some depth in this i don't want to go particularly and um, but there's there's a word in the new testament and it's hades in the, the old testament it's the same place but in the hebrew it's sheol Okay, so in the Old Testament, when you read Sheol, it is Hades in the New Testament. It's the same place. And that literally means the place of departed souls. Can somebody read Matthew 16, verse 18 for me? That's where we'll see it. It's a famous passage of Scripture. Matthew 16, 18, perhaps some can recite it. And then can somebody else uh, read Luke, 19, uh, Luke 16, and then from 19 to 31. So Matthew 16, 18... And I tell you that you are Peter, hmm. and on this rock I will build my church, and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. That's it. We know the scripture. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, the gates of the, of the departed dead will not prevail against it. Thank you. And then let's turn to Luke 16, uh, and reading from 19 through to 31, please. Anybody? Luke 16, 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man yep. who was clothed in purple yep. and fine linen and fared sumptuous, sumptuously every day. Yeah. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, yep. full of sores, who had laid who had laid at the gate, beside the side of the bread, mm. with the crumbs which had fell from the wood from the rich man's table. Mm. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was the beggar, so it was the beggar that died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Mm. And being in the torment in Hades, 
he lifted up his eyes and yeah. saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Yeah. Then he cried and said, <coughs> Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and said Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime he you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all of this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. I said, leave that for now. Thank you, thank you, Sidji. That's fine. I, I won't bother with the next part there. But it's that well-known story of the rich man and and Lazarus. And on this earth, they, you know, the rich man has a a position of of, of wealth and influence. He dies. Lazarus dies. Who's poor? And then Lazarus ends up in the kingdom of God, the, in heaven. And and the rich man ends up in this place called Hades. Now I want to say this to you, hell in its final form is empty. Because there will be a judgment time, uh, which we'll touch on then and go into more detail, where eventually people who don't know Jesus will end up. But that isn't where we are at the moment. This is like a holding area for the departed. And actually, it would appear to be Hades will consist of somewhere where, if you like, the rich man is and he's suffering. He says it's hot, he wants a drink, but he can see, there's a gulf between that, but he can see Lazarus. It's something that he can't pass, but it's within view. There's a conversation that takes place. And so it would appear that at this stage that, that, that people will go into, uh, into Hades and, and, and it may be uh, a place which you could also describe as, because it's a place for the departed, and then uh, it's where paradise is, because heaven and earth are going to pass away, there's going to be a new heaven and earth, but at the moment, so this is where people, when they die, they don't know the Lord Jesus, they're going to be where the rich man is, and when they do, they do know that they're going to be where Lazarus is. But that is not the final place. But look where the rich man ends up. Hot place, place of suffering, place where he's crying out for his family not to end up where he is. And so that's what that word Hades actually means. There's another one now that appears in Luke chapter 12. And we're just going to read verses 4 and 5. Luke 12 verses 4 and 5, and for the sake of time I'll read this, and this is another word for hell, and it is this, and I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, so this is Jesus speaking, and after that have no more that they can do, verse 5, but I will show you whom you should fear, fear him who after he has, has killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now your him in your Bible should be a capital H. When it's a capital letter, it's in mid-sentence, it refers to God. Fear God. Fear God. And that's what he's saying. Don't fear the Pharisees. They can cause you havoc. But once you're dead, they can't touch you. All right, but fear him, fear God, who can control things after death. That's what he's talking about there. And he says here, um, fear him who after he gets killed has power to cast into hell. And that word there is not Hades, it's not Sheol, it's a word called Gehenna. Gehenna. Um, and Gehenna... Um, in the natural, and they would know exactly what this is, was a, was a valley just outside Jerusalem. It's the Valley of Hinnom, which is a combination of that word. And it's the rubbish tip. It's the place of where, they, where, where the rubbish was thrown. It was thrown over the wall into the Valley of Hinnom. You could see it. You could smell it. It was there and visible. Everything entered the valley. And where the rubbish was, they always set fire, so the fires never went out, and the worms were never satisfied. 
So that was that phrase that came out of the valley. So did they actually put people right. over that? Okay, now every crucified criminal could not be given a place, a place of land in a burial. Right. And so they too were thrown over the wall and thrown into the valley of Hinnom. So there would have been dead bodies, unburied uh, criminals in that valley. It's where Jesus would have ended up, his body would have ended up, if he'd have died and not been resurrected. So it was a, it's a, so it's another word for hell, and it's talking about suffering, and it talks about, and Jesus is making a comparison, and he's like, he's pointing to this rubbish tip where there's fire smouldering, where there's that foul smell, where there's worms eating, and he said, you know, fear that place and fear him who can send you to that place where the worm is never satisfied and the fire never goes out. They knew exactly what he was saying. So hell is a place of torment and there are things in there that you just can't avoid. Horrible, isn't it? Horrible. I hope this makes you feel ill, to be honest, because it will give you a drive to be able to say to anybody, yeah. you know, avoid this place. Yeah. Avoid this place. This is not the sort of thing you preach from the pulpit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it needs to be spoken about. So that's another name. Right, turn now to 2 Peter chapter 2. And we're going to read verse 4 only. And this is another name for hell. But this is only used in this situation. And it's only spoken of by Peter. So, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. 2 Peter 2 and verse 4. I'll read it out because of the microphone and for those online. 2 Peter 2 verse 4. And so Peter is speaking, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and deliver them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Verse 5, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah. So this is what we're talking about. Then it goes on and on and on. But that's the phrase I want to put. But For God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell. That word there is not Hades. That word there is not Gehenna. That word is, is Tartarus. Tartarus. So Paul uses, uh, Peter uses a very specific word. And that word in the, in, in, the, in the Hebrew language basically says this, the deepest pit. The deepest pit. Now, who was he sent to the deepest pit? Angels. Fallen angels. So there's a place for humanity. We'll go. It, they will go to Hades. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will go to the paradise part. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, there will be a gulf, and you will go into the... The, the, the hot part, if you like. Is it smoking or non-smoking? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had the light in the mood a little bit there. Yeah. But you have to go into this, 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 this particular, you know, so that's the area there. Um, but then also there's a, a, a place which is worse than that, where the worm is not satisfied and the fire never goes out. And then there's a place that's even worse than that, where the demonic go in a chain. Now this is where I believe the demons go, which you bind. How many times have you bound in the name of Jesus a demonic? Sorry. If you're into ministry, you will be binding. You will be binding. And, and what happens, I believe, you know, it's not something where they just wander around and, 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 and attack again. No, you've bound them, they've gone somewhere. And I believe every demon that you bind ends up in Tartarus. Otherwise, the name of Jesus is not permanent. You know, now there are times where the enemy can return seven times stronger. But you've sent the demon out of the way. And somebody, you know, the demonic uh, influence of alcohol, free, I've seen it in the office there, um, the, uh, of, of heroin addiction. You've, you've had people speak about, only in the last couple of weeks, five years ago, set free from cocaine addiction, mm -hmm. injecting, and all that stuff, burglaring people's houses. You know, the demons that were behind that behavior are somewhere. They're here. They're here. And there will be a day, and a day of judgment, for the demonic. And Paul, uh, sorry, Peter mentions it there. 
And finally, we've got, uh, let's turn to Revelation, and we've got another name for hell, which comes after the, the white throne judgment, which we will talk about, not today, uh, but Revelation 19, and let's read verse 20. Revelation 19 and verse 20. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, who worked signs in, in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast, and they worshipped uh, his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. So after a final judgment, there is a, a final hell, if you like, and that is the, fire, the lake of fire, burning with brimstone, so we know that from that passage there, that it's, it's the Antichrist, which we will talk about later, uh, in some other weeks, and the false prophet, who we will talk about as well. Uh, they go in there, and then let's have a look at uh, Revelation 20, verse 15, and it says, now this is the bit that's of warriors, okay? And anyone, and I repeat, anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hell was never constructed for humanity. It was always constructed for the devil and the demonic forces. But the scripture tells us that anybody that his name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, you will also be cast into that lake of fire. For eternity, and that is the final place of hell, if you like, for want of a better term. It's unimaginable. I haven't got the capacity to understand it. I haven't got the capacity to to even visualise it. But I imagine the closest it would be would be when a volcano erupts and you see that magma pouring down, and you see those, you know, that glowing red hot stuff. It's cast into that. I think you're cast in with a body. So when we're resurrected, and again we're going to talk about this in the future, this is all end time stuff, you and I are going to be resurrected because our, our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, hallelujah. Don't worry, your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, okay? Don't worry, don't worry. You've got a new body, praise God, because this thing is made of corruptible seed. Praise God, I want to get rid of this one. Yeah. Getting a bit tired of it, getting a bit tired of it. So we're just getting tired of this body of ours at times, yeah. aren't we? But we're going, to get, we're going to get a new one, a fresh one. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Those who don't know Jesus will also get a body. Mm -hmm. Because they will be thrown bodily into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. And all the senses and all the, and all the aspects that that involves, the agony and the anguish. You know, it's not some, some spirit that's floating around. We're given bodies. Even the, those that are not in Christ, they're given resurrection bodies. We're, we're so that we can worship him for them so that they can be punished. Awful, isn't it? Absolutely awful. And when I start talking about this stuff, you then start thinking, as I start thinking, of those in my family who are past and don't know Jesus. Where are they? Now I would say this as a pastor, you don't know, so you can't guess. I'll say that again. You don't know, so you can't guess. It is not our job to try and guess where people have ended up. And I've seen people come to Christ in their last Amen. breath. Amen. Their last breath. Amen. And I believe this with all my heart, yeah. that the Lord, those people that are in comas, I believe the Lord is visiting them yeah. in that period of time. Yeah. Um, I believe that there are... Uh, uh, that the Lord holds on and holds on and holds on to that very last moment. That's his heart. Yeah. Because when we come before the judge, we can never say, you've not been fair. You've not been fair to me. He's given us opportunity. He really has. But anyway, let's, let's, let's move on. You can feel the weight of this, can't you? Yeah. All right. Question. Matt, um, please. Uh, what about um, what all this? The bottomless pit. Is it the same as Taurus? All right. Now the the yes, it is. Um, it's a pit that the Lord uses for containment. All right. And so we'll get to this, but Satan will be contained in it for a thousand years, 
And then he, uh, and we'll, again, we'll look at this, he's released again for a season uh, before he's finally then thrown into the lake of fire. So it is, it is a bottomless pit which the, the Lord has created for storage of demonic entities, basically. And so Satan goes in it. Uh, and I love the fact, um, when they're dealing with Satan, you know, um, is that we don't even know the angel's name. He just is an angel, can pick Satan up and throw him in the pit and let him out of the pit and throw him in the lake of fire. He's not even uh, uh, somebody famous. You know, you think Michael would be given that job, wouldn't you? You think, you know, it's a guy just, that's just dealing with the rubbish. It's that type of approach. It's just an angel. So an angel has the capacity to deal with Satan, you know, and yet he causes so much havoc. So much, you know, he makes himself much bigger than he actually is. Now, we have to be careful because uh, I won't mock Satan. Can't, you know, he's powerful in, in, in many ways in our humanity. But we're not in our humanity, we're in Christ. And we're behind, if you like, the name of Jesus. And we're covered with the blood of Jesus. And, and the spirit of God who's greater than he that is in the world is within us. If you stay behind the blood of Jesus and you stay under the name of Jesus and you know that greater is he that's in you than is in the world, Satan will quiver every time you wake up in the morning. And it's not to do with you, it's to do with who's in you. You are now an ambassador. So you are the, you know, so uh, um, all the resources of Nigeria are with the Nigerian ambassador in London. Now he's a guy or a lady, I don't know who the ambassador is in London, but when they stand before kings and they stand, it's every resource of Nigeria is um, as accessible because he's an ambassador or she's an ambassador. Paul says in, in Corinthians that we are ambassadors of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we stand as representatives of every single resource that's in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. As if Christ was saying through us, be reconciled. The world, be reconciled. Oh, I tell you, if only we knew how, how powerful we were and who we represented. So when we're in that mode, we can deal with Satan. When we're in our fleshy, do it our own way mode, watch out. Satan is stronger than that. All right, so, um, so that's the bottomless pit. Holding zone, holding area, lid on it, um, and, and access until finally it's all wrapped up. So, yeah. Any other questions, Mary? Um, yeah, it's just, uh, I, I just keep wondering about the same topic that you were yes. talking about. Like, is hate uh, ensure the same thing? You guys, you're trying to explain something about that earlier, right? Yes. And I'm thinking, hate, show, and then now the bottomless, bottomless, bottomless bit. Yes, yes. So, um, I, I okay, can't... Sorry, the second one. Yes. Why is God letting the devil out of the pit anyway? Why right. wouldn't you just... <laughs> right, okay. So Hades and Sheol, Sheol are the same place, but different, different names. Yeah. Exactly the same place. So that passage we've read about Lazarus is what it looks like. Mm. Actually, an interesting point about that Lazarus and the rich ruler is that the, the, the Lord is given that story and it is literal. It's not a parable. Uh, it's not a... Um, uh, what's the, another phrase I'm after? But it, 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 it is a literal thing. So the reading of that scripture is that there is a literal uh, rich ruler and it's like he's recalling something that they can't see. He actually exists. So that's Hades, that's Sheol, Sheol, or whatever, however you want to pronounce it, for those who don't know the Lord. And there's a gulf between the two. For me, the question is, how can you go through eternity with the Lord and you can't find your precious loved ones? And you know where they are then because you can't find them. So I can, for me, the only way I can square that circle is that the Lord must be able to change something in our hearts where we don't spend the rest of eternity grieving because mum isn't there. Because you can see. You can see. And so there must be something that the Lord does where he, he, he just gives us that capacity to, to if you like, I don't, it's not forgetting, but it, I don't know what he does. It's a God thing. But because you can actually see, there's a gulf, but they can see each other. 
But that's the first phase of it. Now, where, where the pit is in all that side of things, I don't know, but there's, we're talking a, a spiritual construction. Um, and, yeah, what it, how it works, and I, I don't know. I can only go on what the scriptures say. We, we've got a pit, and we've definitely got a gulf, and we've got people on one side and we've got people on the other at the first phase. At the first phase. Now, at the end, and we will get to this, everything gets wrapped up. Everything. And whereas we're going to be with God when we die, the final thing is that God comes to be with us. Mm-hmm. New heaven, new earth. And so it's as, and I spoke about this last week, so where, where the Father, or it's, it's actually Jesus, is walking with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. God is walking with his and there's that relationship, that, that beautiful relationship, it will occur again. Yeah. But on a bigger numbers. Because, you know, the population. There'll be a new Jerusalem. I can't work out how it is, because it's going to be huge. Absolutely huge. Um, it's about the size of the moon. That's the new, that's the new Jerusalem. But there's a lot of people there. And there's a lot of mansions. It actually isn't mansions. It, it, it actually is apartments. That's what it is, actually. Because what we like for mansions can vary. So the Lord is going to give places to live. That's what it really is. But they're not going to be small. You're not going to be queuing for the loo. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Hey, Sue. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's going to be lovely. And, it's, and he goes, he says, to prepare. I'm getting ahead of myself now, but I love this girl. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. So he knows what Rosemary likes, and he's going to prepare a place for Rosemary. Now, it's going to differ from my place, because he knows what I like as well. So it's going to be lovely, but it's going to be just what Rosemary likes. And it's going to, I've already put my order in. I said, <laughs> I said to the Lord, if you want anybody in charge of rivers, I'm your man. I'm your man, you know? And also, I said, I want to do some exploring, because there's an awful lot of that, this world, that we don't... I mean, the Milky Way has barely been touched, but the Milky Way, compared to other galaxies, is a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of his creation. I say, Lord, I'm off. You just told me where to go, and I'm going to boldly go where no Chris Kidd has gone before. (laughs) So that's that's what's ahead of us. But you're talking right at the realm of our imagination about a God who can go beyond our imagination at any time. All right? So was there any other other questions before we move on? James. In one part of the Bible, in my father's house, there are many mansions. That's it. That's it. Where was the mansion? There are many rooms of mansion. Where was the mansion? Be? The mansions are going to be in heaven, and so he 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 says, at the moment you can't come to where I'm going, and I'm going, and it's a place of preparation. So I'm going to be doing stuff, but eventually he says I'm coming back, and he, and he says I'm coming back to take you where I am. And so what he's doing, he says, I'm there, but then the Holy Spirit comes and we have to do all that we have to do. But eventually we will go to the place where he's prepared for you. He's got a place for you. And it's wonderful. One of the themes of the gospel is, is, you know, come around the table, there's a place for you. But also one of the themes of the gospel is, you know, I have a home for you. You know, I've got something for you to do. I've got, you know, there's a, there's a kingdom that's going to be beyond our, our knowledge at the moment. There's going to be stuff to do. We're not going to be sitting around playing with harps, floating on, on, on uh, clouds, you know, thinking, oh, this eternity is going on a bit. <laughs> you, know, it's, you know, but it's beyond us. It's beyond us. Uh, was there another question before we moved yes, on? Yes, one more. Come on then. Uh, doctor, come on. <laughs> got a PhD this week. Enjoy, enjoy, come on. <laughs> Does purgatory exist? Where? Purgatory. Yes, alright, good question. I thought you said it. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that now. All right. Does purgatory exist? Now, there are many people who have a view of the afterlife. And the first sort of group I want to talk about is universalism. You'll meet people who think 
everybody will go to heaven. Everybody. There won't be any sort of uh, change of things. There won't be, you know, we're all going to end up in heaven. It's a universal approach to it. Um, totally contrary to scripture, but you'll find people will have that view. There'll be other people who have a, uh, a, a term called annihil annihilationism. And annihilationism is if you're righteous, you will go to heaven. If you're unrighteous, you will be obliterated. So you won't exist. You won't feel anything because you don't exist. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, that's what you believe. So you'll, you'll believe that, you're hoping that you're the 144, because that's how many they think they're going to go in there. 144,000, sorry. And I've argued, because I had colleagues who were Jehovah's Witnesses, and I said, mate, you know, 144,000 is not a big number. You know, how do you know you're going to be one of them? He said, we've just got to keep knocking on doors and hoping. I mean, literally, they, literally. And I feel for Jehovah's Witnesses, although they annoy me intensely, um, you know, you can't talk to them. It's just that shield goes down. But I feel for them because they are heading for the biggest shock of their lives. Mm. Having knocked on all these doors and the doors slammed in their faces and being ridiculed and not enjoyed a single Christmas. And their children have had the joy squeezed out of them because there's a joyless religion. They found that when they come to the Messiah, he said, get away from me. I never knew you. All that suffering and struggling and hard work is meaningless. And they're annihilationists. So anybody that's not in that 144,000, you are obliterated. You don't feel anything, you've gone, you don't exist. Now here's the thing. Seventh-day Adventists think the same. So do not consider Seventh-day Adventists as what you would call Christians that you have the same thoughts as you do. But in this area, they, they believe in annihilationism. There are other areas, but that's a predominant teaching. Sid you. Right, now, I'm getting on to purgatory now, and Catholicism comes in on that. Purgatory is a Catholic, predominant Catholic belief that if you die in a sinful state, in other words, you have not confessed to the priest, so you die having with unconfessed sin, you enter a state called purgatory, which is not heaven, but where you are then punished for that sin, and it is burnt off you, basically. So you suffer for a season, but then you are cleansed through, to, through the fire, and then you can access heaven at a later time that's obviously declared by God. So you suffer for a season, and then having suffered, you enter. That again is absolutely unscriptural. Because the Bible says this, you know, having, having died, we face judgment. There's no sense of a process. There is, you know, so purgatory, uh, and purgatory really came from, um, there is some books that never made the Bible. Okay, they're in what we call the Apocrypha. Um, which is a series of books that failed the Bible test, for want of a better term. One of them is known as 1 Maccabees. Don't bother reading it, it's nonsense. And the rest of it are all nonsense as well. But in there, purgatory is mentioned. And so the Catholic Church, who do have the Apocrypha in their Bible, have taken a one sentence and built a doctrine out of it. What it does is it gives a false hope for people on this earth, because you are praying now for your mum or your dad, who don't know the Lord, to go from one place to another. And people spend a lot of time interceding and praying, believing that they can move their family out of purgatory and into the heavenly state. Utterly and totally a deception. We must make the decisions on this earth and where we make the decisions, that's where we're in love. We really do. It's, it's absolutely painful stuff, but we have to be so clear on this. And it's humanity trying to change it. So purgatory does not exist, but it came in that way. All right. I think the Muslims, sorry. Oh, go, 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 go. The Muslims, when um, they die, yes. the people are always saying, praying for them yes. to go 
that they should forgive their sins, that yes. God should forgive their sins, and yes. I'm like, yeah, it's a similar, it's a similar, um, if you like, those who are left behind, trying to ensure that those that have gone ahead of them are ahead of them, and so again in the in the Muslim faith, it it, it is, you know, like a like a reassurance thing, you know, you're going to intercede, but again, utterly un- <coughs> unscriptural, utterly <coughs> unscriptural. Simple. Yeah, it was something similar to what she just said, but mm-hmm. I was just wondering. Millions and thousands of Muslims who hold on mm. to their beliefs, mm. they are also going to be part of those ones that end up shocked. Because yeah. you know, there are some, yeah. some of my friends talk like, you know, God is that merciful that even yes. though they didn't believe, but there are too many for God to just wipe yes. out. Yes. Yes. I don't have the answer. But yes. I know yes. yeah, that's the Bible you. says there's yeah. only one way and it's through Christ. Yes. 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 Being. Christianity and Islam are mutually exclusive. Which is why I won't do anything which is joint religion working. Mm. Um, I just, I fundamentally disagree with it. I think it's an utter waste of time. Um, and I don't want to work with the mosque. And I don't, I won't work. I won't work with Seventh day Adventists. I won't work with, with uh, Mormons. You know, these are all because doctrinally we are separate. But Muslims and Christians actually agree on one thing when you boil down to it. That there's only one way to God. The Muslims think their way is the only one way. And Christians know that their way is the only one way. But we're mutually exclusive. There's no, there's no connection between the two. You can't be a Muslim and end up a Christian. You can't be a Christian and end up a Muslim. You either believe in God or you're God or you don't. And so everybody that's, that's uh, a, a Muslim and they're plowing on, I feel for them. Because they, it's based on, um, there's, there's no, uh, there's no uh, righteousness, it's a, there's, no, there's no sense of, of, of repentance, there's no sense that, you know, we know that we know. I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know it. I just know it in my heart. I know, I, know, uh, my, I don't deserve it. Uh, I, know, I understand what the older you get, the more you understand what grace is, because you see how you're wired up and the things that you do and the things that you don't want to do. Paul talks about it, the things I do, I don't want to do, and the things I don't want to do, I do. And I say, amen, Paul. And then he ends it, praise God for Jesus, who delivers me from this body of death. You know? And so, um, I forget where I'm going with this now, I'm having a little preach on my own. Um, but, you know, but, so Muslims in true, true Islam, will say that there's no other way to God other than through, through uh, Allah, uh, and, and uh, Muhammad is the, is, the, is the access point. But if you ask any Muslim, they'll say, but he's practically perfect. All right, because he's a man, he can't be perfect. He was born of a woman. He was born of corruptible seed. But your m- m- me will say, well, Jesus is perfect. Mm-hmm. He was sinless. You know, so it's a difficult, it's a difficult. But there is no compatibility, there's no getting through. So you're right, it, Muslims are heading for the biggest uh, shock of their lives. Billions of them. Hindus, billions of them. Heading for the biggest shock of their life. This is why we're going to preach it, we're going to preach the gospel. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. Because, uh, you know, the, there is more people coming into the Christian faith now than there's ever been. With social media, all the ability to preach, it's just phenomenal. It really is. But we've got to keep pressing on. Time is running out. It really is. Any other questions before I move on a little bit? No? Okay. All right. So does that, that answer about purgatory? All right. That's great. That's great. All right. Now, um, I'll leave that point. Now, I just want to emphasize this. Hell is an actual place. Okay? So you need to, we need to get that, that, that into, into our... Uh, our psyche, as it were, into our thinking. It's an actual place. It's not some, uh, you know, a, a just an area. It's not some spiritual place that doesn't really exist. Um, it, it is a physical reality. And we'll, we will talk in a few weeks' time about the great throne judgment, the white throne judgment in Revelation, which is the day that ends humanity that doesn't know the Lord. That day is the day. Everything that we're talking about comes to that one day if you don't know Jesus. 
Praise God, we're not going to be there. We will come before the throne, but our throne we come before is what they call the Bema seat. It appears in, in Corinthians, we'll talk about it, and it's a seat that gives us a reward. And we're going to get given rewards, hallelujah. Most of us. Some of us are going to get into the kingdom of God, but there's going to be no reward. Perhaps you're, you're in a hostel bed. Perhaps you've done the vilest of things, the most awful of things, and the chaplain is sitting next to you, and you grab his hand, and, and, and you say, you know, he says, just lead me to Jesus. And as his dying breath, he says, amen. And there's no reward for that man. But he gets into the kingdom of God. You're going to meet somebody like that. It was a man on the cross next to Jesus. Did nothing for Jesus. Didn't attend a single prayer meeting. Didn't evangelize. Didn't even pray. Other than, remember me. Remember me. And it was like the Lord was saying, well, hold on just for one more. one more. One more soul. One more soul. And so he'll get in. I don't want to speak to him. What's it like? What's it like to have all this? And get in. Just get in on the skin of your teeth. Yeah. So there will be, there will be those who, who are not rewarded other than the reward of being in the kingdom of God. But there will be rewards given, and, and we, can, we will talk about this at, at, at some other time. Um, and I think many of us are going to be surprised as to who's going to get rewarded. There are going to be people that you've never seen, you've never had uh, any profile in the media or at all, and they're going to get incredible rewards from God. Amen. There's going to be people who have massive ministries, Huge television ministries, thousands coming to their services. I'm talking church leaders because that's an easy thing to think about. And they will get a minimal reward. And the reason for that is that their reward was the praises of man. And they got it. They got it. They got what they, what they needed. They got the praises of man. But it doesn't have any currency in heaven. None whatsoever. So whenever you see sort of accolades to church leaders, whenever you see particularly, you know, when the, when the denomination gets big and, and, is, and is influential in all areas, pray for those leaders. Because unless their humility takes over, they're heading for, again, a big surprise. Because their reward is that. That's what they've got. They've got the praises of man. And some lady that's been on her knees for 40 years, interceding for a nation, mm -hmm. praying quietly, but like a rolling boil of prayer. She's going to get a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful reward yeah. as, as the throne, those around the throne part, and the Lord calls her forward, and her place will be closest to the throne. And it'll be amazing, and it'll be wonderful. Great is her reward, because she works behind the scenes. But you see, this is the thing about God, is that he's perfectly fair for two reasons. And I'll close with this. One of them is omniscient. Okay? He knows everything. He sees everything. Nothing is hidden from his sight. The other one is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He is physically there. He's missed nothing. He sees everything. He knows everything. He's the ultimate witness. And when this judgment appears, this, this time of judgment, there will be no appeal. There will be no defense. There will be no words said. All that will be is books will be opened. And in the books will be things that, have been, that a person has said, a person has done, and a person has thought. I also think this, that there will be those opportunities to have come to Christ that they refuse. And they will be as guilty, and they will be then removed. There will be no conversation, nothing. No words. And they will then be cast into the lake of fire. For eternity. Serious stuff. Serious, serious stuff. But I'm going to close with this. All right, we'll go back on this. I can see some very... Uh, shocked faces in a way, you should be shocked. We need to understand hell and it needs to shock us. Yeah. But my, one of my favorite, um, this is the Bible school I went to, it was Spurgeon's, and I, I love him, but it was, a, it was a, a, the London Evangelist, the Victorian London Evangelist. And Spurgeon wrote this, he said, if sinners be damned, at least let them reap, sorry, let them leap to hell 
over my dead body. And if they perish, let them perish with my arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let no one go unwarned and unprayed for. Unprayed for. That was Spurgeon. And that's you and I. We've got to have that sense of, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to keep witnessing to you. You can rebuke me. You can rebut me. You can drive me back. But in the name of Jesus, I'm still coming. I'm still going to witness to you. I'm still going to love you. Because when the breath ends, it's over. It's over. And we are on this earth for one reason and one reason only. To be witnesses to Christ. Because there will be a day when it's just you and me and Jesus Christ. There won't be any witnessing. There won't be. And when you're in heaven, hallelujah, Pastor Peter, a powerful man of God, but he's not doing any more witnessing now because he's in glory. He can't do it. It's, you know, it's our turn. It's our turn. It's our turn on this earth. We are the ones. We are the, the ones who have got to preach the gospel, have got to show the love of God. We're the hands and the feet of Christ. Hallelujah. To be continued. To be continued. Get passionate about it. Passionate about this subject. And understand its importance. I know you do. I know you do. So let's pray. Father, I want to say thank you for uh, today's subject, as heavy as it is. We don't just speak about it without having the good news with it. And we thank you, Lord, that there is a way through Christ. And I thank you, Lord, that everyone in this room has received you as their Lord and Savior. Their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And we will come before a throne, but it will be to receive a reward and to enter a place that you've built for us, tailor-made for us. We thank you that in Christ there is a future and a hope that is eternal. But Lord God, let the alternative drive us on, Lord God. Let it be uh, that we'll take wounds. Let it be that we'll, we'll get exhausted for the message. Let it be for the price of a soul. Our loved ones, our family members. Lord, I pray for those who are dabbling with Christianity. Our family members who, who have heard the gospel and have perhaps responded, but they're a long way from you now. Let them understand that we cannot sit on the fence. We are either in the kingdom of God or we're in the kingdom of darkness. We're either advancing the kingdom of God or we're advancing the kingdom of darkness. Help those who are backslidden. Heal them of their backsliding uh, uh, ways, Lord God. Let the fear of the Lord fall on them before it is too late. And Lord God, thank you for the testimonies of those lads that on Team Challenge, Lord, who were the ones that we'd avoid in the high street, the ones who were criminals, addicted, and Lord, now they're on fire for you. Why? Because their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and Lord God, hell has, has no hold on them. The kingdom of darkness is no longer their place. Lord, there is hope, but it's in Christ. Help us, help us, Lord, to be bolder with what we say. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Hallelujah.